Hello YouTube. Once again, I want to tell you about obscure but fascinating pages of history, which are basically many times are hidden from us in the mists of time. The Chuvash Republic is located in the center of European Russia, in the heart of the Volga Vyatka economic region, mostly to the west of the Volga River in the Volga upland. It borders with the Nizhny Novgorod region in the west, Mari El Republic in the north, the Republic of Tatarstan in the east and southeast, Republic of Mordovia in the southwest, and the Ulyanovsk region in the south. There are over 2,000 rivers in the Republic, with the major ones being the Volga, the Sura, and the Tsivil, as well as 400 lakes. Well, Herodotus writes that the Greeks captured the Amazons in one of their campaigns and wanted to take them to their Hellas or Greece. But something went wrong, and at night the Amazons slaughtered their captors. Amazon sailors were of poor quality, and they couldn't control the ship. As a result, the ship washed up on the shore where the Scythians lived, Presumably, it was on the northern shore of the Black Sea, possibly Crimea, but this is not accurate. On the shore, the Amazons, they, did not, they, they didn't lose their heads. They stole horses and they began to terrify the Aborigines. Well, the indigenous warriors decided that it was better to resolve the conflict peacefully somehow and offer the Amazons to become their wives. The Amazons agreed, but, but they did it on their own terms, that they would create their own settlements. And, you know, they would visit each other when the need arose. This is how the Saromat, or Sarmatian, people appeared. Here's what Herodotus writes about the Saromatians. From here... Saromatian women have been leading their own way of life for a long time. They ride horseback, hunting with and without their husbands, go to war and wear the same clothes as men. Regarding marriages, they observe the following rule. No girl marries until she kills the enemy. So, again, the Greek historians reported that the Saromatian women wore men's clothes, rode horseback, hunted, shot arrows, and were skilled with weapons. Again, the girl could not get married until she kills the enemy. And if she couldn't do so, she remained unmarried for a long time. Some sources mention the custom when some women, like the Amazons, even cut off their right breasts to be stronger in battle. But after marriage, they usually engaged in raising children and farming and marched to war only if absolutely necessary. Ancestral cemeteries were often created around the burial of an influential Sarmatian woman. For example, back in 1928, uh, Soviet archaeologist Grakov discovered 11 mounds around the burial of the priestess in which a red stone dish was found. He concluded that the Sarmatians had a cult of ancestors and they revered the ancestral woman. Usually, priestesses were guardians of the cult of fire and sun, worshipped the goddess of fertility. In addition to jewelry and household items, weapons were also placed in the grave, mostly arrows. Less often, it would be swords. Among all the excavated mounds, approximately 20% were burials of armed women. This suggests that the that women were mostly archers. Greek historians mention the Sarmatian queen Amaga. Her husband, King Medosak, became interested in drinking intoxicating honey and soon abandoned the management of his state. The queen herself was engaged in state affairs, led the army, and went on military campaigns. When the Scythians attacked ancient Hersonas, that's the Greek city. The inhabitants of the besieged city turned to Amaga for help. In one night, together with her warriors, 
she rode 200 kilometers, killed the Scythian king and handed over power to his son. But despite their belligerence, the Sarmatians still remained real women. They loved beautiful dresses and jewelry. Scientists during excavations often found clothes made of expensive fabric. Usually they were trousers and long dresses tied with a belt and fastened with fabulous, decorated with turquoise, enamel, gold plaques, gold embroidery, and beads. The shoes were pointed and also ornate. The outfit was usually complemented by beads, bracelets, tiaras, earrings, and rings. A mound was excavated in the Mykolaiv region in which a purple cloth with gold embroidery was found, on which, in addition to ornaments, olive branches were depicted. The Saromats left behind a glorious history, but they themselves have gone somewhere, vanished. But the scientists believe that they did not disappear without a trace, but moved north. Moreover, moreover their descendants reached the Altai Mountains and the Ural Mountains and also settled along the Oka and later found themselves on the territory of modern Chuvashia. It is difficult to say which of these are myths and which are true, but the fact is that the ancestors of modern Chuvash, the Suvars or Savirs, came from the western Caspian Sea and the North Caucasus. Um, most more often, we know them by another name, the Hans. So Attila is, in a way, a national Chuvash hero. The Suvars, the ancestors of the Chuvash. Well, there are not very many documentary evidence of the Suvars left. Mostly are mentioned of Greek authors. So Claudius Ptolemy places Suvar in the Caucasus, below the Aur Sea and the Pejigarites. And Stephan of Byzantium clarifies that they live between Colchis and Persia. Jordan reports that the Suvars and Alsagirs were related branches of the Hanic tribes. In the 6th century, they raided Byzantium and Iran and periodically participated in Byzantine Iranian scuffles on one side or the other. A branch of the Dagestan Hans who lived on the territory of the Hani Kingdom, which included the territory up to modern Derpent, also merged with the Suvars. Historical facts are complicated and sometimes are overshadowing any myths. The story of the Hans as Suvars is proof of it. Look, I will not bore you with long lists of names of disappeared tribes and kingdoms, but for a long time. You know, but by the 9th century, the political situation had changed and the Suvars, under pressure from the Arab raids, moved north along the Volga River. There they became part of the Volga Bulgaria and built for themselves the city of Suvar near Bulgar. At about the same time, according to Orientalist Kavalevsky, there was a metamorphosis from the word Savas, Savas to Chavash. In any case, it can be concluded that the Chuvash are not relatives of the Tatars, as is often believed. Although there are many similar words in modern Chuvash and Tatar languages, but this is not surprising after several centuries of living side by side. As for their beliefs, the Chuvash are not very original in the model of the world structure and believe that it, the world, is divided into three levels. The upper one, the world of the gods, is Shulti Tionche. The middle, the world of the people, is Sutionche. And the lower world is Leshtonche. By the way, pagan culture, customs, and rituals are still common in Chuvashia, by the way, as is in neighboring Mariel. And as I tell you about interesting people of Russia that no one knows about tribes or ethnicities, uh, you, you can find out about the pagan beliefs, uh, 
which is a recognized religion, I guess, in part of Russia and so forth, not far from there too. Also, this is a treasure trove for ethnographers. It's like a real time machine to immerse oneself in the culture of the sewers. One can go to a very interesting place, the Ethnocultural Park Sewer. For some reason, little is known about this place, even in Chevaksari city there. The park is located on the other side of the Great Volga River. Moreover, to get there from Chebaksari, you need to leave the Republic, uh, drive a little along Mariel, and then return along the, along the other shore again to Chuvashia. Well, in 1993, a sculptor named Nikolai Mikhailovich Baltaev, also known as Paltai Mikuch, began making wooden sculptures dedicated to the Chuvash epic in that location. Subsequently, other sculptors joined him, and as a result, now there are 130 sculptures in the park. According to the three-part division, they represent three worlds located on three mountains of the park. The upper world on the Golden Mountain is inhabited by gods, Iltan II. In the middle world, people live on the Silver Mountain, Kemel II. And the lower world on the Copper Mountain, Pahar II, is reserved from the chthonic beings and demons. In the center of the park, there is a tree of life that unites three worlds. The park area is seven hectares. So if you decide to visit all three worlds, take time and patience. It's not easy to find all the figures, but those who visit should follow the paths and signs. The park apparently leaves a huge impression on visitors. So this is yet another chapter in my, <clears throat> I would say, decades-long research of the Amazons, of the female warriors of the past, and you can see more in my YouTube channel about the Amazons. Not many videos, but those that I make are very detailed, and you find out things that, of course, will not be in your country's textbooks, but should not be forgotten. Those mysterious ancient Amazon warriors worldwide in Eurasia, in Africa, in the Menon Kingdom, and uh, other places of the world. Thank you for your attention to my work. If you can support my research, and I appreciate if you can, you can do so through the links you will see in the description to this video. Please like my videos and subscribe to my channel.